27. And this chapter has a little bit of a strange ending. Uh, it's all about vows and redeeming vows. You know, how many of you have made a vow to God? Now, I'm going to get more hands up because I'm going to ask you, how many of you have committed your life to Christ? You've made a vow to God when you commit your life to Christ. You see, a vow is voluntary. It's not mandatory. God never twists your arm. He never says, yeah, you got to do this. It's voluntary. You do it because it's good for you. And you do it because God loves you. All vows, again, are voluntary. And we're going to see that in this chapter. In this chapter may seem a strange way to end this book of worship. In fact, if you are reading the Bible through, and you came to this chapter, you may say, why is this here? I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand it. And that's why reading the Bible through is a wonderful thing to do. And many of you do that. I know I can't name how many times Tony has done Not that my mother used to read the Bible through every year. But there are some chapters and there are some books that you need a little help with. Otherwise, you kind of read through it and say, what have I just read? Leviticus is one of those books. So therefore, that's why we decided to study Leviticus. And in fact, some commentators either add this last chapter as an addendum or an appendix, some just leave it out altogether. They don't understand how I got here. Well, I'm obviously not going to do that because I think there's a reason that it wasn't left out. In fact, Dr. Kellogg puts it this way. All before this chapter is mandatory, this chapter is voluntary. So he ends it with asking you to do some things that is voluntary. You don't have to do it, it's not the law. So it is a beautiful and fitting end to the book of worship. And this is a book of worship. From the beginning to end, the author of this book tells us how to worship God and the way to worship God. And when you get to the end of the Bible and the book of Revelation, what do we find in Revelation chapter 4? What do we see in heaven? There's the angelic beings and the elders up there. What are they doing? They are falling down, casting their crowns before the one on the throne and worshiping. That's what they're doing. So the end of the book is kind of like the end of Leviticus. This is a whole book of worship. It's voluntary, and the basis for it is one word. And we talked about that this morning, and that one word is love. That's why we worship. It's love. We love the one that created us, put us here, and taking care of us, and will redeem us, and take us home to live with him forever. It's a beautiful and grateful response to a God has, who has done so much for us. That little chorus, uh, give thanks for a grateful, with a grateful heart, used to be one of Tony's favorite courses, uh, may still be, I don't know, but you're giving thanks with a grateful heart. And that's the natural response to a saved person and that recognizes the fact that God has saved them. Psalms 116, 12 says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? It's a good question, man. How can I repay him or what can I do for him for all the things he has done toward me? Well, we can't measure up to that. But we can love him and we can worship him. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12, 1, this very familiar verse, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. 
Now, what he's saying is, I beg you, not that it's mandatory, but I beg you because it's good for you. It's the way to God. Micah 6 8 wrote this, and this is in response to a grateful heart. He said, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Again, we do that with a grateful heart. Every believer wants to do something for God. It's our desire. What can we do? The biggest problem is to find something worthy to pledge to God. David Brainerd cried out, Oh, that my soul were holy as he is holy. Oh, that it were pure as Christ is pure. What can a saved sinner offer to God? Well, this chapter partly answers that question. You can make vows to God and keep them. And we're going to learn that when you make a vow to God, it should be something of value. Proverbs 20, 25 says, It is a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy and afterward reconsider his vows. In other words, if you make one, you don't take it back. And if you do, God says, I will charge you double. You may make the inquiry first, and that's what you should do before you make a vow. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 through 6 says this, and that's a good warning. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not vow than to vow and not pay. Do not your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? The most notable vow in the Bible is one made by a judge named Jephthah. Remember that guy? We were in Judges not too long ago. And in Judges 11, verse 30 and 31, I want to read that to you. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, that was a bitter enemy, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's. And I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Well, remember it was his daughter who ran out to meet him? What I do now? Well, first of all, God was not going to let him sacrifice his daughter, so that's not what this means. But he did offer her up to the Lord. She remained a virgin all of her life. That's a difficult thing for a, a Jewish woman, not to have any children. She didn't. In fact, it was in that day, there was four days a year that they went and they visited with her and they wept with her because she didn't have any children. So even though God didn't ask him to sacrifice his daughter, he did ask him, he made a vow to commit his daughter to the Lord, where she had no children for all of that time. It's a serious thing to make a vow to God and not keep it. Many Christians have been set aside for not keeping their vows. By the way, I want to go back to that verse because there's another way it can be translated and you can substitute it for or, or for it. In other words, or I will offer up a burnt offering. So God was not asking him to do that even though it was a rash vow. 
I'm going to close this opening section with the last passage in Deuteronomy 21 to 23 and set the stage for this chapter. It says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be a sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin unto you. In other words, you don't have to. That which is gone from your lips you shall keep and perform, for you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. Okay, here we go. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by vow certain persons to the Lord according to your evaluation. This is a little bit confusing in the King James. The NIV cleans it up a little bit. It says when you make a special vow or something of value. In other words, when you make a vow, you should offer something of value. Don't, don't give something not of value to anyone, much less to God. David said he would not offer something donated to him. 2 Samuel 24, 24. Somebody gave him something. He said, would offer this to the Lord. And he said, I will never offer something that I didn't purchase that wasn't of value to me. It's like the man went to Las Vegas. He's standing there at the crab table. And he's probably a half Christian, whatever those are. <laughs> he said, Lord... I'm going to bet on snake eyes. You know, that's big odds. And if you give me snake eyes, I'll give you half the winnings. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I'm sure God didn't honor that. In fact, I'm surprised lightning didn't come down and crash on this guy. But if you're attempting to give God something that costs you nothing, I'll use one word, don't. He won't honor it. A successful businessman was asked one time, what's the secret to your success? And he says, well, God shovels it in, and I shovel it out. And he's got a bigger shovel than I do. <laughs> so he was successful because he gave back to God every time God gave to him. Verse 3. If your valuation is of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If it is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. First thing you're going to say is, <laughs> how does this work? Well, it isn't like it sounds, and I'll try to clarify that because it's not on the surface what it is. These valuations were set according to the labor market. In other words, the women had to bear children, they had to take care of their families, and all that kind of stuff. So they could only work, let's say, part of the time, 50% of the time. So therefore, they were evaluated on the labor market. By the way, these were the standards in those days. That's how this is evaluated. When a person was dedicated by a vow to God, it did not mean they must serve in the tabernacle, like a lot of people think. That was the job of the Levites. There were other things that they were allowed to do, but a redemption price could be paid to relieve them of that service, and that redemption price went to the temple. Do you remember Hannah? She made a vow. She brought little Samuel into this world because she was there praying in the temple and Eli thought she was drunk because she was very emotional, she had no children, she had no son, she wanted a son so badly and she told God that if he would give her a son she would dedicate him to the Lord or lend him to the Lord all the days of his life. Did she do that? Yes. She had little Samuel. By the way, he turned out to be a great man. He was the last judge in Israel, and he was the one that anointed the first king, Saul, and the greatest king in Israel, and that was David. A great man. 
But she made a vow to God and she kept it. Verse 5. And if from 5 years old and up to 20 years old, then your valuation for a male shall be 20 shekels and for a female 10 shekels. And if from a month old up to 5 years old, then your valuation for a male would be 5 shekels of silver. And for a female, your valuation shall be 3 shekels of silver. Now they weren't on the labor market yet, but they were future value. You know, like stocks have a future value, so that's how they were calculating that. And if from 60 years old and above, if it is a male, then your valuation shall be 15 shekels, and for a female, 10 shekels. I don't get the math on that, but that's the way they evaluated. I guess all the kids are gone. The ladies can work a little more. I, I don't know, but anyway, that's the way it was. But if he is too poor to pay your valuation, then he shall pre present himself before the priest. And the priest shall set a value for him according to the ability of him who vowed, the priest shall value him. Now, this, the, the scale of values was set by age and not by social position, as so many things are today, or riches, or prestige, or anything else. The value, again, was based on the ability to labor. And notice how God took care of the poor so they could participate in this program, otherwise they couldn't. Jesus said to the, to the widow, remember when all the guys were coming into the temple and they were throwing their coins into this thing and rattled around and demonstrating how much money they were giving and this one widow came in and all she had was one little mite, which is equivalent to probably a penny today, that's all she had. But she put it in there. Jesus said that her offering was worth more than all of those other gifts put together in heaven. Verse 9. If it is an animal that men may bring as an offering to the Lord, all that anyone gives to the Lord shall be holy. He shall not substitute it or exchange it, good for bad or bad for good, and if he at all exchanges animal for animal, then both it and the one exchange for it shall be holy. In other words, if you change your mind, you want to give something else, then you have to give both. So you can't change your mind. The story is told that the pastor in this little country church was asked by a farmer to come to his home for a gift or a dedication to the Lord. This guy had a little calf that he wanted to give to the Lord. You know, in that day, uh, you didn't have a lot of money, so you gave what you had. So the pastor looked at this little calf, and it looked pretty sickly. But he says, no, I want to dedicate it to the Lord. Well, <clears throat> as that calf grew up, it ended up being a blue ribbon winner and was worth a lot of money. And the guy said, you know, I don't think I want to give that calf. I got another one over here that I want to give to the Lord. <laughs> you don't do that. He owed both to the Lord or he would pay for that sin. Verse 11. It says, if an unclean animal which they do not offer as a sacrifice to the Lord, then he shall present the animal before the priest. Remember, we went through a whole chapter on clean and unclean animals, and the clean animals you know can sacrifice. The unclean animals cannot be sacrificed. And the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad. As you, the priest, value it, so shall it be. But if he wants at all to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth to your valuation. I don't totally understand that, but the way I understand it is an unclean animal could be offered because maybe someone didn't have a clean animal to bring to the Lord in a vow, but the person offering it had to pay a fine of 20% because it was an unclean animal. Verse 14. And when a man dedicates his house, 
to be holy to the Lord, then the priest shall set a value for it. Whether it is good or bad, as the priest values it, so shall it stand. If he who dedicated it wants to redeem his house, then he must add one-fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it shall be his. The home of a man or woman is their most sacred material possession. He could pledge it to the Lord or not. That was up to him. We've had a long-standing member of this church who went to be with the Lord a few years ago. A fairly wealthy man. And he had, I believe he had three children, but uh, he told me, because I was talking to him, because we were talking about thinking about setting up a foundation several years ago, that his home was going to go into his foundation and they were to give it to the Lord. He said, I've taken care of my children. They all have homes. They all have a good living. They all have jobs. They're taken care of. I don't want them fighting over my house. He had a beautiful home on the beach worth millions of dollars. I don't want them fighting over my house. I want to dedicate it to the Lord. And he did that. You probably know who he is. Verse 16, some of you anyway. If a man dedicates to the Lord part of a field or his possession, then your valuation shall be according to the seed for it. In other words, what it produced. A homer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. By the way, most of these evaluations were the standard of that day. They came from uh, east of there, where the, where, during where the cradle of the civilization was. So it was kind of a standard. So he's not, God's not dictating this based on nothing. If he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee, according to your valuation, it shall stand. But if he dedicates his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon to him the money due according to the years that remain till the year of Jubilee, and it shall be deducted from your valuation. Let me step back a minute. A couple of weeks ago, we went through chapter 25, which was the year of Jubilee, and basically every 50 years, under God's law, everything went back to the original owner. All the slaves were freed, and the original owner of the house it went back to. All the debts were forgiven. That's why they called it the year of Jubilee. It was jubilant. Maybe not to the one that had all the possessions, but the one that didn't have anything got those back. So you know that. And if he who dedicates the field ever re wishes to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth of the money or of your valuation to it. And it shall belong to him. But if he does not want to redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. But the field, when it is released in the Jubilee, shall be holy to the Lord. As a devoted field, it shall be the possession of the priest. And if a man dedicates to the Lord a field which he has bought, which he is not the field of his possession, then the priest shall reckon to him the worth of your valuation up to the year of Jubilee. And he shall give your valuation on that day as a holy offering to the Lord. And the year of Jubilee, the field shall return to him from whom it was bought to the one who owned the land as a possession. And all your valuation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary, 20 geras to the shekel. I would hate to be the priest or the accountant that had to account for all this. <laughs> I hardly understand it reading about this, but I'm sure they had a record somewhere and the high priest and the priests were held accountable for accounting for all these things, but this was the law of the land in that day. It was a very complicated system. The land could be dedicated to God even though the land belonged to God. God stated many times in the Torah, over and over again in the first five books of the Bible, the land is mine. Now what land is he talking about? He's talking about the land we know of as Palestine, the land that was given to Abraham and his descendants. You can read 
about the borders of that land where it was in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. He repeated it again. So we know exactly what that land was, but many times the Lord said the land is mine. In other words, I'm giving it to you for the period of time that you have it so you can work the land, but it's mine. And I find today in Psalms 24, it says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. It belongs to the Lord. But what did he do when Adam and Eve was in the garden? He gave it to them to have dominion over all the things and over all the land. And what did they do? They blew it and turned it over to the devil. That's why we're fighting with this guy now. He's been defeated, but he's still at work, seeking who he may desire to devour in this world. Now, <clears throat> there are three things here which are the Lord's apart from a vow. Verses 26 and 27. But the firstborn of the animals, which should be the Lord's firstborn, no man shall dedicate. Whether it is ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. And if it is an unclean animal, then he shall redeem it according to your valuation, and shall add one-fifth to it. Or if it is not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to your valuation. The firstborn of both man and beast were already claimed by the Lord and could not be devoted or dedicated to the Lord in a vow. Remember when the Lord brought ten plagues upon Egypt? And the last one was he took the firstborn, some people missed this, not only of Pharaoh, all the land of Egypt, but of the animals. The firstborn of all the animals. Because God said, they are mine. That's why he gave a double portion to the firstborn in his inheritance. God says, I'm going to give you my portion and your father give you the second portion. And they were the ones in line to be the family heir and take the place of the father. That's why God took the firstborn of all the families in Egypt, which Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go. He paid the price. They were already his to do with as he pleased. Verse 28, Nevertheless, <coughs> no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord, of all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. No person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall redeem, but shall surely be put to death. The second classification of things that could not be devoted or dedicated in a vow to God was that which was already pledged to God in a vow. In Joshua, we learned that Jericho was devoted to God for destruction. Because Achan took of that which God had told them they should utterly destroy, Achan was destroyed. God keeps his word. You can read about that in Judges 6 and 7. Verse 30, And all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's, it is holy to the Lord. If a man wants to all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. You know, I've told you many times before, I grew up in a Pharisaic home. My mother was a Pharisee. My dad wasn't quite that way. He was a little more freer, but my mother took everything of the law very seriously. So therefore, what did Ron Klein say this morning? Anything that was fun, was sin? No. I'm not sure she went quite that far, but I started tithing when I was probably eight years old because I was working in the fields, earning a little bit of money. By the time I was 10 years old, I was buying all the things I needed except food that she put on the table. So occasionally, and my mom taught, taught me from the very beginning that, that I should tithe, and I did. But occasionally, since I was taking care of my own goods, I would run out of money. I said, Mom, I don't have enough money to tithe. She said, okay, you just add 20% next week. 
I said, where is that in the Bible? She says, I don't know, but it's in there. <laughs> I found it. I knew she was right because she read through the Bible all the time and I knew it was in there somewhere. I, just like uh, she used to tell me, uh, your sins will find you out. And I finally found that in Numbers years ago. I knew it was in there. And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. In other words, the tenth of the animals also belong to the Lord, so he couldn't pledge the ones that already belong to him. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it, and if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchange for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. The tithe was the third thing which already belonged to the Lord and could not be pledged or dedicated in a vow. Today, under the New Testament covenant, we are not commanded to give a tithe. It is a free will offering to God. I know some don't agree with me on that, but I find it insinuated in the New Testament, but not actually written. But if you've made a vow to give a tithe, which I did at a very young age, you should surely keep it. I think the reason he did not give us an order to tithe in the New Testament, he didn't want to limit our giving to a tithe. He wanted us to be a free will offering. Jesus said in the New Testament, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Matthew 5, 33, in a Sermon on the Mount, what did he mean by that? He meant, don't make any rash promises. Just say yes or no. Then you're free when you want to make a vow or to give something to God to do that after you've thought it through because it's a serious matter. In other words, don't make rash vows. But when you make it, you are to keep it or pay the penalty for doing so. And the last verse in Leviticus, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. Well, there you have it. The end of the great book of worship. Yesterday, as you know, and yesterday morning, it was raining. Sometimes a little bit, sometimes hard. I play golf on Saturday morning, so I decided I would go show up. I knew my buddies would be there. And yeah, it was raining. So they said, if you want to play golf today, you can't take any carts. You have to walk. And uh, so I thought about that a minute, and I said, I'm going home. Well, my buddy said, no, we're going to walk. We're going to play. I looked at him, and I said, well, I can't be the only one that says I'm not going to do it. So I took my little push cart. And Waded through the rain and the mud and the slop and everything and up and down hill and dale. And when I was coming to that last hole, thank God this is the last hole. I'm done. I'm out of here. I was whipped. I thought it would feel like that when I came to the end of Leviticus. Thank God it's over. <laughs> But I don't. I kind of miss it already. It's like I have 66 children and this is one of them. God said, be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Before we let you go, I've got just a few minutes left here. I have in the back, I don't know how many copies we have, but I think it's if you, if you take one per family, I think we'll be fine. This is a summary of the book of Leviticus, and it's by Ray Stedman, who's one of my favorite commentaries. I'll tell you how good he is. He was the mentor of Chuck Swindoll. He was his mentor. He passed away many, many years ago, but uh, he's written a lot of summaries of books. In fact, I have a big book about this thick, where he's written a summary of every book in the Bible. But the first page of that, I would like you to commit to read, if you don't read all 12, I encourage you to read all 12, please read the first page. I know the print's a little small, 
get out your magnifying glass or have somebody else read it to you if you need. But he gives the meaning of holiness, which is the theme of this entire book. The meaning of hol holiness. And what he says is that holy means wholeness. It means whole. It means to be completed. You see, until Jesus fills that vacuum in your heart, you're not completed. So you're not whole. So if you think of holy as being made complete or made whole, that's the meaning of holiness. That's why even in these sinful bodies, we can be holy before God. Because he has made us whole or made us complete. So again, I hope you have an opportunity to read the whole thing. It is excellent. If you don't, at least read the, the first page and you will know what Leviticus is all about. And I hope it will stay with you. God bless you all. Hopefully we'll see you next week.